Okay, so two quick things before we start. Firstly, tonight on the Omega on Plays channel, I'll be streaming some Euro Truck Simulator. Going forward for the time being, American Truck is being shelved until the Washington DLC comes out. Second, after the absolute pasting I took in yesterday's video's comments, many indicating to me that I don't understand Trump because on one hand, his approval rating is good, on the other it is bad. His policies are seen as good on one hand and the other is bad because them party lines, yo. I decided to make a totally non-political video, instead talking about the poor suffering of Hattie. Who is Hattie, you might ask? Well, it's a wonderful question you asked, because Hattie was missing. Hattie was missing for quite a while, I think two weeks. Hattie was found, though, which is fantastic news. Small problem, though, was that Hattie was stuck for about six days. Where might you ask? Well, Hattie was stuck on the Royal Albert Bridge. This is the Royal Albert Bridge. It's quite, quite big-ish. Now, I know many of you are now wondering, how did Hattie get stuck on a bridge? Well, that, I'm afraid, is a mystery Hattie will take to her grave. You see, she doesn't speak a language we are all able to translate, or any of us are for that matter, because Hattie's a cat. Yeah, that's right, everyone. A totally not political video. Good luck shitting on me for this one. <laughs> I'm gonna have fun with this. So as many of you know, there's a purpose for emergency services. We have the police who maintain law and order, or turn a blind eye, depending on which community. Remember, I'm not making this political though, so we won't be going into that. Then we have medical, the ambulance, whose job it is to take someone to hospital. They are the taxi for the needy and keep them alive if they can. And then we have the firemen or the fire brigade. Let's not be sexist here. Their job is to put out fires, investigate fires, the causes especially, and to be the heroes of communities when communities have been hit by truly atrocious acts. Not going to be political, so I'm not getting into that, but they also have another job. It is the cliché of their job, but it is an important one. It is the saving the cat out of the tree. I've seen cats climb up trees, typically to chase a squirrel, which is quite amusing because the squirrel's like jumping about, the cat's confused, chasing it, thinking it's a mouse, and then realizing once it's halfway up the oak tree, a ah, ball. I appear to be stuck. Meow, meow, meow. Someone get me Fireman Sam. <laughs> now the owner of Hattie, Miss Howden, had reported a cat missing, but when the cat was spotted, or a cat was spotted on this bridge, the fire brigade had to get out all the cords, all the rock climbing, all the ladders, only to realize they may need some gaffer tape to stick those ladders together, because this one's a big one. Can you imagine being the one unlucky guy enlisted with carrying that ladder? Although I'm somewhat surprised that while they were busy going to B&Q to get this ladder, I'm joking of course, seriously, articled below, by all means read it, I'm not re for you. They couldn't have just gotten one of those, um, craned devices, you know, the ones that are electrically powered, that could go up without the need of a ladder, which would have undoubtedly made quite a large noise and startled the cat even further. Now we know they blew their budget on this ladder, because they apparently couldn't tempt her out with sweets and kibble, which may have, because of the money being spent on that ladder, been quick save no frills. Or, for Americans, the Walmart bargain bin damaged. So after six days of being totally unsuccessful at getting this cat out of this rather precarious position, something rather interesting occurred next. See, the cat got so fed up of them presenting inadequate kibble that the cat decided, you know what? Screw you guys, I'm going home. And the cat decided to go on its own accord, which means somebody left the ladder unattended and the cat climbed down, went home, and went to bed. Now, understandably, the cat is a little bit thin after two weeks and, of course, being uh, malnourished. Generally, when you present a cat with cardboard, if the cat has the energy or the spare, they'll just take a big dump knee. I think in this instance, we can all safely say Hattie defeated the fire brigade by simply doing their job for them. The cat saved the cat self when you presented the cat with an out and left it unattended long enough for the cat to take however long it takes to get down a ladder that large. For a cat that's malnourished, let's go with a minute, maybe two and then the 500-yard walk 
from there back to the owner's house. That's right, everyone. The cat wasn't that far away at all. I think the cat found the ideal hiding spot. Miss Howden, have you been feeding your cat quick save no frills? Because if you have, Hattie was well within her rights to naff off and hide and starve herself to purge her system of all the crap you've been putting in her. Hattie lives matter, everyone. Let's make that a hashtag for this video. <laughs> yes. What has me truly curious about all of this is how the cat got up there to begin with and why no one thought to I don't know. Reach out to the train operators and simply have them cease operations long enough for someone to go around behind the cat and get the cat which I doubt would have taken long. Naturally, the train operators may want to consider for future cat mischievous behaviours, putting a chain link fence around the offending area where the cat was able to climb up. I can't imagine it scaled one of the pillars. I don't see the cat wearing a hard hat or straps, which is totally how people climb rocks these days. Anyway, all in all, this is a good story, don't you think? Nothing political about it. The fire brigade did their job, they failed at it. They got a massive ladder, it wasn't right. And the cat either went down the ladder or took the other route, the route it originally came from, which was undoubtedly along the train line, back home, where the cat stank, was a bit skinny, and decided, screw you guys, I'm now going to bed. Feed me in the morning. Don't forget to tuck me. Read me tales of mice being killed in the Great Mouse Purge called the catening. Anyway, I think I'm done with this. And what I'm going to do to end the video, because I want to share with you other content I make that's totally not political, I'm going to finish the video with one of the tales I told over on the Moist Ski Reads channel. Yeah, I basically took the ski off Warski because I'm not convinced he'll be on YouTube within the next few months if he doesn't change his act. But who knows? I am, like all things, truly open to being proven wrong and would like him to be here long enough for me to make my content cop on him. Sorry, content constable. So, the tale I'm going to finish with is the fourth tale I've ever told. It's called Vignala Thotep. So please sit back and enjoy this totally not political content. Mmm, nice. Today we shall be continuing with our works through H.P. Lovecraft, with the tale of the Nyala Thotep. Nyala Thotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last. I will tell the audience void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill current that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demonic alteration in the sequence of the season. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world and perhaps the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that the Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt, who he was, none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from the places not on this planet. Into the land of civilization came Nealothotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which spelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nyarlathotep, and shuddered. And when Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, 
that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Yala Thotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelation, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friends said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, that what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but Nyarlathotep dared prophecy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which only shewed in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see Nyarlathotep through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room and shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms amidst ruins and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments and I saw the world battling against blackness against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end, whilst shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Nyarlathotep drove us all out, down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swear to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive, and when the electric light began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon. From when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious involuntary formations and seemed to know our destinations though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to shoe where the tramways had run. And again, we saw a tram car, lone, windowless, dilapidated and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow column, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alleyway to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently felt a chill which was not of the autumn, for as we stalked out of the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows, trackless, inexplicable snows, swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed, as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green litten snow was frightful and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished, but my power to linger was slight, as if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid, into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable, screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell, a sickened, sensitive shadow, writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low, beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temple that rest on nameless rocks between space and reach up to dizzy, vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping were unto dance slowly, awkwardly and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods 
the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nyarlathotep.